Good morning. It's 26 degrees at 6 o'clock. I'm Lee Harris. Here's what's happening. Police are still looking for clues in the fatal shooting of a bank early today. 25-year-old Burke O'Brien was talking to his former college roommate after a night out and was shot in the chest inside a Lower East Side building as he tried to unlock the building's front door. Burke O'Brien was shot in the heart on Orchard Street in New York City. It happened before the sun rose on January 12, 2003. Police arrived minutes later to find him motionless on the sidewalk. He would be dead before he could reach the hospital. About 4.30 this morning, a uh, male was shot in front of his friend's building. I'm Christina Kiley. I'm a news producer who was embedded with the NYPD for ABC News. I was on the scene with my camera for almost 30 homicide investigations, but one of them stayed with me and with everyone who was touched by the case, the murder of Burke O'Brien. More than a decade later, I got a call from Kenny Sylvia, the original detective on Burke's case. Hey, Christina, I'm just frustrated with the way this whole case has been, like, forever. I want to do what I think is necessary Anything that needs to get shaken up, I'd love to bring the O'Brien family some closure. I want to move with this thing, do whatever I can, and to find justice for Burke. For him, this is the one that got away, the case that he couldn't forget. And he wanted my help to see if we could finally get some answers. From ABC News, this is a murder on Orchard Street. Andy Dietz was the commanding officer on the scene. He was the skinny, tall, scrub brush mustache homicide detective who looked like he'd walked right out of 1958. He had 20 years on the job, and he knew his stuff. So you got two girls and three guys. They went to a club earlier tonight. One of those girls was Burke's sister, Rory. She was 23 at the time. Burke actually wasn't supposed to be in New York. He was planning on leaving to go back down to D.C., but stayed to surprise me. He's a really good brother. He was my best friend in the whole world. Really fun night. We went out to go see some music. We danced, we hung out, visited with friends. You know, kind of walked around the city. It was getting late, we wanted to go home. We split two cabs. I was in one cab, he was in the one right behind me. We were like dancing half hour earlier. You know, you're supposed to walk in the door two seconds later. But he never did. Burke had taken a cab with his former college roommate, Forrest Blody. Before the two got inside the six-story walk-up, Burke was shot. Forrest came, like, dashing in through the, through the apartment door, screaming that he needed a phone. I walked outside, and I saw Burke there. He's not awake. Burke, he's not awake. Forrest kept saying he'd been shot, and he'd been shot, and I was taking off his T-shirt trying to see where that, where. I've seen people who are, like, unconscious before. I didn't, didn't register at all that he had been shot and was dying. When the EMTs arrived minutes later, they found three young people. It turned out to be Rory, Forrest, and his roommate. They were hunched over a stocky redhead who was lying motionless on the sidewalk. By the time they got Burke to the hospital, he was already dead. Forrest told the cops he watched the whole thing go down. He's saying it was a robbery that a male black and a male Hispanic robbed him at gunpoint, just shot his friend in the chest. But we got an independent witness, a male black, that just happened to be walking down the block sees the shooting, the actual shooting. That witness had a completely different story. Here's how another detective described it. Um, when he's walking down the street, he sees two people standing over here, having a conversation of some sort. He There's can't tell if it's arguing. Yeah. Yeah. No one on the street but no those two. He hears a, a bang. He sees the perp reach down, grab a jacket, put it on the victim. At that point, he walks down the block, makes the 911 call. Police then show up. And he's just standing there kind of watching what's going on. And then the witness told the cops something that really got their attention. Here's Sergeant Dietz again. He hears 
a male white talking to the police, telling about how a male black and a male Hispanic uh, robbed him at gunpoint and shot his friend in the chest. He grabs another cop and says, listen, that guy's lying. I think he shot somebody. That guy the witness was talking about was Forrest. He would become the main suspect. Police took him in for questioning, along with Rory and the two other friends. <laughs> right now we have four people here, two males, two females. We have our possible suspect, his roommate, the victim's sister, the uh, victim's sister's friend. But what was the motive? Why would Forrest shoot his friend? We're pretty certain the other two girls and the guy are telling the truth, that they don't really know anything. They're not saying there was any argument in the bar. Like, they don't give any indication of why this would have happened. So we're thinking sometime on this cab ride, these guys get into some fierce argument. It's probably over a girl. We think the, the friend, based on what witness uh, accounts, shot the other friend in the chest at a 45. I got a call that there was a homicide. I'm, I'm on it. I'm in the car. I was going to be the lead detective on it. At this point, Kenny Sylvia from the 7th Precinct joined the case as lead detective. Handsome, articulate, and intelligent, dirty blonde hair, and confident enough to rock a hoop earring. I shouted him throughout the rest of the investigation. The story that I got when I got to the precinct was that Burke and his friend got into some sort of an altercation over what we didn't know, and uh, his friend pulled out a gun and, and shot him almost point blank. At the precinct, after a long interview, Kenny described to fellow detectives what the witness told him. He's standing and all of a sudden he says, this one guy raises his arm, he hears a pop, the other guy falls. Right. The guy that he raised his hand now goes over, picks up this guy's jacket, lays it on him, and then goes into the building. The guy's wearing all dark clothing and he's got like a knit cap on. Mm -hmm. He said it's, it's gold, yellow, and brown or something. Yeah. So now this witness turns and goes half a block away, calls 9-11, says, I think somebody got shot. By the time he gets back, he hears this one individual telling the cops, I put my jacket off, because he can't ID him. He can't say, that's the guy I saw before. Now because now we don't have a hat. Forrest did say he'd put a jacket on Burke before going inside to call 911. But police didn't see him wearing a knit cap until they came across this. A fleet bank, the ATM, where the suspect supposedly withdrew money. When Burke and his friend came pulling up to the street. They needed to get some cash for the, for the cab, so they stopped right on the corner for Forrest to, to withdraw some money to pay for the cab. Sergeant Dietz and his team reviewed the security footage from the bank. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's him, that's the camera of the door shot, and that's him, his back. And then, the grainy footage showed a man walking up to the ATM. It was Forrest. That puts him with the hat on. It's got a big white stripe on the top. So Forrest was wearing a yellow and brown knit cap that night, which fit what the witness told them. The cops thought the pieces were beginning to line up, but that didn't prove that he shot Burke. They needed to find the weapon, and they needed to, to find a motive. Sergeant Dietz thought he might have a motive, and it had to do with what he suspected was a love triangle between Burke, Forrest, and Rory's friend. The uh, victim's sister's friend. Apparently she was going out with the victim at some point. Now, last night, she might have hooked up with the alleged perp. They didn't know that the, that, uh, the victim was going to show up there, but he showed up there at about 10.30. The last night, apparently, in the bar, Forrest, this guy, they somehow hooked up. And the way she's saying it, they were on their way to her grandmother's house to get together. And it got screwed up with the cab, Harvard and Forrest. They wind up in the wrong cab. Now maybe the conversation between Forrest and our victim, yeah, I'm going to go back with her. Maybe that pisses him off. That's what it's going to, I have a feeling that's what it's going to turn out to be. Drinking, jealousy, rage, put that all together and you got a shooting. So that's where we're at. But the police still hadn't found the murder weapon. They had the bullet, but no gun. And Detective Sylvia said it wasn't just any gun. Burke was shot with a 45 caliber. The fact that it's a 45 caliber, too, is something that's a little bit odd. In this, the streets of New York, 45 calibers are not a very popular weapon. They're usually smaller calibers, 38s, 380s. These are small weapons that are easily concealable. A 45 caliber is a very powerful weapon. It's a very large weapon. 
But where was it? Rory's friend gave the detectives a lead, though I'm not sure she meant to. She mentioned that a window in the apartment had been opened sometime between when Burke was shot and when police arrived. That would have been a, a, a really logical place for Forrest to have thrown the gun. Um, because he comes into the apartment, he has to get rid of the gun. Obviously, somebody's going to be looking for a gun. And to throw it out the window would be a real easy thing to do right then and there. The apartment is small. Uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning, on a night that it was freezing cold, would definitely raise suspicion. Can we get through there? No, no. So Sergeant Dietz, his team, and the 7th Precinct detective searched inside and outside the apartment. Uh, Steve, are there any uh, dirt balls in this warrant? If we find a gun in the apartment, that's just as good as a confession. As they rummaged through the rooms, they found something else. We found the hat that uh, he might have had on, based on the ATM video, but so far no gun. The police continued to search outside the building, up on the roof, down in the basement, in gutters. We went out, under, we did this whole entire area. Doesn't make sense. Next theory. I watched them get more and more frustrated because without a gun nearby, it would be much harder to prove their theory that Forrest was the shooter. But Detective Sylvia, or Kenny as everyone called him, had a major concern. Maybe Forrest was telling the truth. Here you have a guy, he's 24 years old, he's got a college education, he's you know, out of school only about a year or so. For this type of charge, um, you know, if this thing ever goes to a trial and he's convicted, and it's not him, then his entire life is gone. None of that would happen. Authorities later decided not to prosecute him, but not before his freedom was put on the line. Next time on A Murder on Orchard Street. I've made hundreds of arrests before. In this case, it just didn't feel right. Thank you for listening to our first installment of A Murder on Orchard Street. If you're interested in this story, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a quick review to help others discover it too. You could submit tips about this case to the NYPD by calling 1-800-577-TIPS. Again, that's 1-800-577-8477. A Murder on Orchard Street is a seven-part series produced by the teams at ABC News Nightline, ABC Radio, and ABC News Digital. Our website is abcnews.com slash Orchard Street. New episodes post Tuesday mornings on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play Music, TuneIn, Stitcher, and the ABC News app. You'll find our other podcasts there too, and at abcnewspodcasts.com. I'm Christina Kiley.